don't think you're better. Don't think you're different. Don't think you're unique. You're just like everybody else. Learn from the experts and try not to make the mistakes that they made. And we're live, baby. Richard Corbett. <laughs> He's in the building, wheels to walk in, always making moves. The greatest videos on the internet, and it hasn't been a skill that popped up overnight. I, man, I'm so grateful that you're on the show. First off, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, and uh, wow, what an intro. Appreciate <laughs> that, man. <laughs> I mean, seriously, like I, I, I speak to a lot of YouTubers. I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs and humans that are making moves, and I am so grateful to be speaking with you today because... I haven't seen anybody that has come close to your level of authenticity when it comes to telling your story, being super real with your audience, and turning a really shitty incident into sort of, you know, the cornerstone of your entire business. Uh, it's amazing. And I know that at some degree, it's probably pretty therapeutic to you to be able to take something that most people see as a, like a, a crash and turn it into your new landing. Yeah, not just some degree, like to every degree. It it's been a way, an outlet that I can take the worst thing that ever happened to me and turn it into the best thing that ever happened to me. And um, I, through a, a bunch of series of events in my life, I managed to get really comfortable sharing my story in a one-on-one -on -one environment and then really comfortable sharing it in a private environment. And then um, since I got so used to sharing it so many times, I thought it's not going to be scary to go public with this. And I think that's why I have um, not just the vulnerability, but the confidence behind the vulnerability. And I'm not afraid uh, to share my ass or excuse me, not afraid <laughs> to show my ass at all right. um, because I, I have zero guilt and shame around uh, my past at all. And it takes a lot of mental work to get to that point where you realize that most people have effed up pasts, have a lot of problems, are just as screwed up and messed up in the head as many of us are. Yet we are so scared of people seeing our vulnerabilities and our insecurities. And I mean, it makes sense, right? You go through this horrific accident and that must have done damages and numbers of damages just to your psyche. And then to be able to come out of your shell and, and, and come out and just, it's incredible. And now you take this platform and like all podcasts aside, like I am truly blown away by what you said. Like, you know how like YouTube creators, like they'll, they'll watch some other people's videos, but typically they just stick to like making their own stuff. They're not consuming. I watch right. almost all of your videos. Wow. Thanks, dude. You're, you're so genuine. You're so real. And like when I mean like that vulnerability, it's, it's amazing. And it just tells by the traffic you get your channels blowing up. Your videos are so unique. Uh, his channel is wheels to walking for everyone listening. And That's the you, number two, wheels two walking. <laughs> can you give us the premise behind the name of the pod and, and the name of the brand? Yeah, so uh, in order to tell or in order to answer that question, I might have to give you a little bit longer uh, answer. I hope that's all right. Um, so in 2020, excuse me, <clears throat> I'm terrible. It's, <laughs> it's early. My it's, words this it's morning. It's early. Yeah. It's early. So in 2010, um, January 18, 2010, I was out for a run here in Atlanta, Georgia. And here in Atlanta, we've got some underground parking decks. And um, unfortunately, um, one of the ventilation shafts was open and I fell into an underground parking deck down 50 feet. And that broke both my legs um, and ended up paralyzing me um, from the waist down. Um, that in turn um, was what diagnosed as a spinal cord injury and something called an incomplete spinal cord injury, which means the spinal cord was damaged but not completely severed. Um, pretty quickly, I thought I'd accepted it, or at least I believed I'd convinced myself that I accepted it. And worked really hard to get back to work and school within about nine months. And that is a feat that not a lot of people that have spinal cord injuries can achieve because uh, this particular type of injury wrecks your entire life. I mean, half your body stops working and um, the compelling future that you had for yourself that you were working towards just kind of vanishes. And I was pretty stubborn and said, you know, I'm not gonna let that um, get in my way. I'm gonna continue down the path that I was and I was able to adapt to my schooling and being able to adapt to my work, but it just wasn't the same. Um, I really didn't enjoy it the same way I previously enjoy it. And before I knew it, I found myself um, working at like an Apple store selling computers. And that wasn't a bad thing. It was a really great culture. Um, but unfortunately, at the time, um, I never psychologically 
really dealt with the impact of this injury on my life. I kind of just did the whole fake it till you make it thing. And unfortunately, uh, it turned pretty toxic to the point where um, I couldn't really manage my emotions and unfortunately slipped into the grips of addiction. And, you know, just a lot of the, the meds that the doctors were giving me just really helped silence the voices in my head, more or less. Um, that took me down a really bad path for a couple of years where I ended up in a really bad place where I was pretty much just living in a dirty, stinky, nasty, gross basement apartment, real addicted to drugs and um, just completely abandoned my life and um, didn't want had to have to do anything with anyone and has pretty much was ready to die, um, whether by my own hand or the hand of the drugs. I really didn't care at that point. I'd given up. Um, whether fortunately or unfortunately, I had a a really terrible um, mental break where I had a wicked manic episode that resulted in the police getting involved and me getting arrested and basically uh, put in psychiatric jail, which is like a, um, it's not a criminal jail, but it, for your mental health, you are legally compelled to be there in order to get your, your mind right and your head right. And that was um, in October of 2014, or November 1st of 2015, or excuse me, November 1st of 2014 is my clean date. And um, since then, um, I went through a whole series of inpatient and outpatient rehabilitations. I stayed in um, a transition home, like a sober living home for about two years, and attended a bunch of 12-step meetings and uh, sought therapy and just continually um, just worked on myself and my inner demons and it was just a huge area of exploration and that was kind of where I, I briefly mentioned where I learned how to tell my story publicly or excuse me privately with a with a therapist and in groups and in my meetings and with my sponsor and just kind of working through all the mess that was inside me um, but a real amazing thing happened is once I stopped poisoning myself my body started to heal and um, six years after my accident um, I spent about another two and a half years, um, getting my diet right, started working out, and then I started doing my own physical therapy, and um, I was actually able to get back up on my feet again and start walking again. So the wheels to walking is my story from wheels to walking, and um, you know I didn't like putting the from in front of it. I thought wheels to walking would be a little bit more catchy, and so I had this story that I had told in private a bunch of times. I, um, but I still had a lot of uh, guilt and shame around it. I'd never been public with it. And then uh, luckily I met a guy by the name of Andrew Deitch who had a podcast who invited me onto his podcast. Shout out, shout out Andrew. Shout out Andrew. Um, and he's actually a partner in Wheels to Walking and we're gonna dive into that here in just a minute. Um, and uh, for the first time ever, I shared my entire life story from when I was born to current on his podcast and it was like a two and a half hour long podcast and Andrew does these really great interview shows where he just like asks the right questions and can really make you feel liked and um, I really enjoyed that and I, I listened to that podcast like over and over and over and over again and I thought like wow like I've got something special here but I don't really have anywhere to say it like I, it feels like I got a lot to say, but nowhere to say it. So I, I tried a bunch of different outlets, a bunch of different ways to tell my story without me actually being involved in it. Because again, I was really kind of like a like guilt and a lot of shame about, you know, having being a wheelchair user and a guy with a disability and having, you know, diagnosed uh, mental health issues and, you know, a recovering addict. Like there's a lot of junk that, you know, um, comes with, you know, all the stereotypes and the stigmas with each individual one. And I had three, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was doing everything I could to almost not talk about it. And luckily the way the universe works is it doesn't let you uh, kind of escape your, your purpose and your meaning. And um, I, I really was in a, in a place, it was like the summer of 2017 where I was watching a whole bunch of Casey Neistat and was feeling really inspired. And, you know, he had said something about like, um, you don't have to be an interesting person. You just have to have a unique perspective. And I thought, well, um, I don't know if I've ever seen a lot of um, people in wheelchairs on YouTube. And I did a, a bit of research and didn't really find a whole bunch of stuff and thought, okay, jumped on Amazon, got myself a little vlogging camera and a gorilla pod and made a couple of videos. I, I made one about how I go grocery shopping and one about how I go to concerts, which are 
just things that I do regularly, but because I'm a wheelchair user, I do differently. And um, people were really intrigued. Other wheelchair users were intrigued, able-bodied people were intrigued, and it got a lot of traction. I think with those two videos, I got like 5,000 views and over 1,000 subs, um, which for two videos on YouTube with someone who's never done YouTube and had never edited any videos before is, is a pretty good hit. And um, I thought to myself like, wow, I've got something special here but this filming stuff and this editing stuff is gonna kill me. Um, and that's where um, I connected with Andrew again, and he was at a point in his life where he was ready to quit his job, um, wanted to travel and wanted to make money uh, filming. And I said, hey dude, we got something special here. And I also saw that there was a white space in the market, um, particularly inside of the disability, um, durable medical equipment, hospital medical equipment field, where they were not taking advantage of social media marketing and they were not taking advantage of influencer marketing the way that I thought they could. Um, and you know, we're about a year and a half into this journey and I'm still having a really difficult time talking to people that don't even understand email marketing. Like these, these people, these companies are archaic in their marketing. Um, but we'll jump into that a little bit later, but I, I basically approached Andrew. I was like, Hey man, like, let's do something like for real, like let's get serious on this. And we teamed up with another friend of ours who um, is really good at setting up systems and backends. And um, we all partnered up together and um, we spent probably, I wanna say like 10 weeks, maybe even three months, like behind the scenes building it up. We then went on a trip and banked about 10 videos. And then when we came back, um, we started editing them and launching them strategically. And um, it pretty much, took off real quickly. And I think that, that also had to do with um, Andrew's skill set as well. You know, uh, a lot of the times I refer to him as my producer, but he's way more than that. He does all of the visual stuff. Um, I do all the non-visual stuff. So I'm, I'm the personality who's got um, the storytelling and some business savvy and some business acumen behind, my, behind me. He's got a lot of visual storytelling and marketing skills behind him. So the combination of us to, together um, are kind of a force to be reckoned with. And since we pretty much jumped into a niche that existed, but wasn't really that powerful or that big, um, it wasn't too incredibly difficult to dominate with um, some strategies um, that I'd learned um, through a bunch of different, um, you know, courses and teachers and podcasts. And you know how it is. Um, we're really lucky and fortunate enough to be in a time and era where if you don't know something, it's pretty easy to become an expert or almost an expert on something. And usually there's a, like a knowledge barrier. Eventually in your search for things, you'll reach a knowledge barrier. And that's usually where you have to start paying for coaches and whatnot. But um, I've been treating this like a startup from the beginning because I knew that I wanted to um, find a way to share my experience, strength, and hope with as many people as possible and turn it into a monetizable career. And I knew that YouTube was a place to do it. And I knew that the market I was trying to hit was other wheelchair users. And I knew that the products and services that they used were not using social media marketing the way that they should be. So we've just been um, really causing a storm in our industry. And what's even more amazing is we've actually been able to be acknowledged outside of our industry and inside of the YouTube industry um, where we were nominated and won a Shorty Award for the health and wellness category, which is insane because we don't even have our silver play button yet. We still haven't hit 100,000, but um, because we've been putting up consistent quality content for over a year and a half, and we have such a like hardcore group of fans that are extremely loyal to us because we have literally shown up, changed their lives, and helped them to continue to grow and flourish. So they'll do anything for us, which is really beautiful. That was for an entire YouTube success tutorial you just gave people. <laughs> <laughs> that, you just gave the recipe, the ingredients, and the oven right there. <laughs> well, I mean, I think another thing that makes me unique is that I don't hide anything. Like, I share everything I possibly can. I share my mistakes. I share my successes. I share how I did it. You know, I'm not afraid of copycats. If anything, I want copycats. You know, like I want people to try to do what I'm doing and especially inside of my niche because all waters, raise, all tides raise all ships. And 
um, you know, I believe strongly in collaborations and even with collaborations that aren't necessarily going to benefit you because I collaborate with people all the time that um, maybe not are popular on social media or probably don't even have an Instagram channel or excuse me, probably don't even have a YouTube channel, but simply because I'm not afraid of someone being able to do what I do slash what we do. Um, because I know the combination of um, my story and my personality and Andrew's um, shooting and editing skills, like we are um, unmatched. It's cool to have that yin to your yang. I mean, that's easily the, the YouTube and that world of online marketing is so beautiful and open fields just to hop on your horse and soar. But to be able to do it all, to build the recording, to, to edit, to put it out on the right platforms, to get it out on social media, then to meanwhile create new content, it's a full-time job if you're going to do it good. Uh, to find that yin to the yang and be able to do it symbiotically, kind of that co-founder type mentality it just shows a lot to you and Andrew's overall just growth as people as working together. And I'm sure it hasn't just been complete sunshine and rainbows. Do you guys ever run into some pretty serious bricks where you're just like, yo, I, we got to take a break from each other. <laughs> Believe it or not. No. Um, all of our arguing and fighting always is in the scope of making better content. So we have a really good way of um, knowing which hat we're wearing where um, as, a, as a person who's not really creative, I might have a vision and I might try to explain that to him in a certain way. And if it doesn't come off the way I want to explain it, I'll give him some feedback and vice versa. If we're in the middle of a shoot and I'm doing something that he thinks sucks, like he'll straight up tell me that sucks, do it again. You know, like we, we frequently are in conflict, but it's never in conflict with each other. It's in conflict about the content because we don't allow feelings to get involved in this. We're, we're not the kind of people that are going to like let our emotions soar um, because we know that we want to put out the best product because we're trying to make bank, dude. Like we're, we're <laughs> trying to make some money and we're trying to put out consistent quality content. And it's, it's not just about the money. Like we've, it's three eyes I like to focus on is, is the influence the impact and the income. And we've really got our influence up. We've really got our impact up to the people that we've, I mean, we literally get messages all day, every day about how the channel has changed people's lives. And, and it's really cool to keep up to date with those people because they go on to flourish. And that's just like, that's my success. Like forget the likes, the comments, subscribers, followers, whatever. I don't care. What I care about is the people that message me and say, Hey, that one video, that was so important that I'm now a different person. And, you know, since this is a business, we still want to make sure that we get that income. And 2020, we've really been focusing on just cranking up our money making, you know, activities. And um, luckily, because I've got Andrew on my side, I have a lot of time to focus on money making activities. I have a lot of time to network. I have a lot of time to make phone calls and send emails and, you know, um, do interviews and just anything I can possibly can to um, bring a lot of awareness and awareness of our professionalism and our seriousness and, and how we're not here to play. Um, we're here to, to shake up the industry as much as possible. What have you learned about the monetization aspect of YouTube? I mean, obviously, you know, there's the, when most people think of monetizing on YouTube, they think ad revenue, right? But there's so many things beyond that, selling your own stuff, merchandising, um, any sort of coaching, consulting, things of that nature. Can you kind of share a little bit about how you think about monetization and, and sort of uh, any insights into that strategy? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we initially started out with a patron, um, Patreon, even before we had any videos out. Um, and the way that I got people on Patreon was through a series of emails I called the Untold Story. Um, where basically um, I kind of do a real deep dive into how Wheels to Walking started, my story, and how we ended here today. And I really encourage people to support the mission of Wheels to Walking so we can continue to deliver entertaining and educational content for free. And, um, you know, so having uh, people inside of a crowdfunding source was really great. Um, eventually, once we reached the milestone of uh, AdSense, we jumped on AdSense, and that was, that was great. Um, also, uh, working with any type of affiliates through Amazon, which unfortunately kind of took a big hit recently, but um, that 
goes to show the people that we're cultivating relationships right now that we can get customers activated and move. And then even um, very simply, we started with uh, merchandise as our first physical product. Um, but we've, so that's a couple of streams of revenue. And then also we have our podcast, which I'm currently on the set right now. So um, those of you that have heard me talk about Andrew a bunch, um, you can jump on our Wheels to Walking podcast and we co-host um, that podcast together. And that's a new episode every Friday. But, um, you know, we have sponsors there as well. So we've got a couple of um, revenue streams. But what I've come to find out is Andrew and I are really stringent and really particular are about our autonomy, our creative vision, and our workflow. Like we don't like people telling us what to do or people telling us how to do it. And we've come to find out that um, the easiest way, easiest way, I say that in air quotes, for us to be able to do whatever we want, whenever we want to do it, is to create our own intellectual property, our own products and services. So we're currently in the position where we are developing and building um, more of our own products and services. Because right now, we you know have like patreon and some tiers on patreon involved for example like phone calls with me um so even you can sell yourself because anything that takes your time and attention as a human being that's valuable and you can sell your time and attention you can even sell your expertise um which um later down the road i hope to potentially even have some type of agency or coaching program that is specifically for other disabled people that want to get involved in youtube and want to um, start making a living outside of like a social security disability check. Because a lot of people get stuck inside of those traps. Well, I like that you mentioned the whole making bank thing in terms of everything you mentioned prior, because it basically paints the picture like, look, you're treating this like a business because there is a very moral ethical background to the whole thing by you succeeding and you making money and your channel blowing up the inevitable cause of that is changing lives, is getting in front of more wheelchair users and people around the world that are in a dark place, that have been through this similar situation. I mean, what's crazy to me is that in life, there's no way to ever prepare for something like what you're doing and dealing with and done in your history without going through it. Like, you can't tell me, I can't watch every one of your videos and totally feel like I get it, I get it now because I'd have to be in that wheelchair for years and understand that despair and going down that dark path to really be able to become the person you are today. And we as humans, we aren't planned for that. That's adversity. We live on a giant rock in the middle of time and space where anything can go wrong. So I think it's so interesting that you're able to, to link that all together, to take that story, but also build a business and you're upfront about it. Like you're a for-profit business. Like you're trying to make Money, this is a business that can span. YouTube's a powerful marketing tool. If you do it right, if you do it consistent, all you need is that one or two tickets. I, I like to call them lottery tickets, right? Because if you get one or two, it blows up. I mean, we had Matt Santoro on the podcast, 6 million subscribers. We've had multiple people with millions of subscribers and they always talk about that some of the cardinal rules of YouTube seem to be consistency, relentless consistency, right? Never, ever missing it. And then just being real and authentic. If you can do that consistently for a long period of time, it's just so interesting how people can just go today, start that brand, build the brand. And you guys are full time. You're independent. This is, you're all in on this now. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, we have strategically from the beginning knew that we were building a marketing engine. Like from the very start, we knew that we were building a marketing engine and the strategy initially was to incorporate products and services inside of the disability space. But as I mentioned earlier, we were discovering that it's more and more difficult um, to work with people because they don't even know about it or understand it. Like I, I was talking to some CEO the other day and he was like, oh yeah, let me Google the Instagram real fast and see what you guys are doing on there. And I was like, ooh, wow, okay, dang, like we're really dealing with some like dinosaurs here and it's like do we spend all this time teaching people or do we just use the marketing engine we've built for our own products i mean granted that's more complicated that's that's more that's more investment that's more development that's more time that's more patient that's more risk but honestly that's more rewarding and you know he and i are both in it to make money but not necessarily in it 
to get rich because we know that we want to scale big. Like we have huge visions for what this place or for what this company can do, but it takes a lot of money to do that. And we know that we want to do things that impact more people in more places more powerfully, but that obviously takes money. So we are not shy at all when we talk about like we're here for profit we're here for money we're here to scale and we're here to i mean shake up this industry a lot like people that are in the disabilities space slash wheelchair industry might listen to what we're saying and might get a little upset at this but it is incestual it is toxic it is corrupt there's a lot of money being made in the gray area there's a lot of weird relationships between manufacturers and insurance companies like it just, it's like ethically, like values based. Like I feel almost like dirty, like hanging out in there sometimes. Cause I'm like, y'all are doing it like weird. Like, I don't know. Like the more, the more I get involved and the deeper I get into the rabbit hole, I just get icky. Like I get this really like icky feeling inside of me where I'm like, I don't like any of this. And, and even how the some some of the companies that are working with with influencers that are working with people through social media marketing are tragically underpaying them and i mean using them to their advantage um willingly like knowing that they can like extremely underpay them because they know that if they pay them too much money their their you know disability check will get cut so they're t they're using that to their advantage and that that rubs me really wrong like I'm, I'm not a huge fan of taking your, your customer and your community and intentionally using them to your advantage. Um, it just doesn't, it just doesn't sit right with me. I can imagine there must be some sort of level of corruption and, and uh, it's non-humanness going on in that. Because I mean, if I were to tomorrow get in a, a similar accident to you and I had to get a wheelchair, right? I'd probably want to spend as much money as I possibly can to get the best wheelchair and this is just a very simplistic um, just scenario, right? This is way deeper than what I'm talking about. But if I were to get injured, I'd want to spend a lot of money to get the best wheelchair to make my life as good as possible. And, and I can assume that people could take advantage of that, that need. I mean, that's what happens in healthcare around the world, right? You know, that's, you're in a situation, you're, it's dire, nothing's more important to you than getting this. And you're willing to fork up everything you have to do it. And people can take advantage of that. So, like, that's the world we live in. Yeah, absolutely. And um, particularly with my kind of injury, um, you have a spinal cord injury, which is usually pretty abrupt and pretty traumatic. Um, you've probably lost your job. You might have lost your insurance coverage. Um, you potentially have, could have been the sole provider. Um, you might have to sign up for like state and government insurance, but that takes a long time to get. So what usually happens is the, the individual who's receiving the item is the one that gets screwed while the insurance company you know, charges a lot and the manufacturer charges a lot. And the, and the end result is that you get not the best quality of product, in my opinion, but the two people that win are not the final users. And um, that is a part where I really, really feel strongly about because I want to jump into that mix and say, everyone needs to win, not just the insurance companies, not just the product manufacturers, but the actual end users and not to be like disgustingly overcharged. Like, even specifically with um, adaptive equipment, um, say hypothetically, I want to get into a sport, say I want to get involved in track or I want to get involved in basketball, or um, let's say even something a little more crazy, like let's say I want to get involved in adaptive skiing or adaptive wakeboarding. Like at a minimum, it's anywhere between three to $5,000 to even get like a starter chair that's used that isn't even properly fit for you because the the markups are just so ridiculous and that usually has to do with fda approval like you have to go through so much research and development and testing and approval process that that creates an expense that's unnecessary for the actual raw item and then the insurance company then has to compensate for that because the insurance company can only pay out for things that have been you know fda approved so it's this big back and forth where like just the, the cost of things go up and up and up and up and up and you know luckily the company that makes my wheelchair um, doesn't mess with insurance at all so they can do all of their own R&D and not have to worry about approval so let's say for example um, there's a, a, an insurance a wheelchair company that has a wheelchair 
that costs $5,000. Um, parts and materials don't cost that much, but the development of that wheelchair costs about $5,000. The insurance company might pay $3,000 of that cost, and you as the end user are stuck with $2,000 cost left over to you. The company that I've worked with have, have cut that out, and their raw material cost and their research and development cost is like 1500 bucks. So by going without insurance, you're actually saving money, which is insane to think about because insurance should be there to cover you. But insurance can only cover products that have gone through all these insane a labyrinth of, of testing and so much red tape, all this crazy stuff. And then not to imagine that our current federal government is slashing and cutting um, a lot of coverage, everything from cushions to particular wheelchair wheels um, to even custom fit wheelchairs. They think that it's a one size fit all, which is silly because these things are custom prosthetics just in the same way that like a actual prosthetic, like say you lost an arm would fit. Um, but this is me just galloping around talking about some of the issues that I see in the industry that I, I hope to shake up because I'm new, which means that I'm not involved with anyone, meaning there's, there's no incestuous relationships anywhere. Also, that's my disadvantage too. I'm new. No one knows who I am. No one can trust me. No one really wants to work with me because they don't know what I'm necessarily up to. So that's kind of my challenge to the point where I'm like, either I can work continually really, really, really hard to try to shake up the industry from the inside out, or I can just continue to be an outsider and develop my own products and develop my own services and continually like make money and like change unwritten rules to the point where um, it, it'll, it'll almost force everyone else to try to have to work with more values and more morals and more ethics because I care about the end user because I am an end user. And, and I think that's, where um, I'm finding a lot of <laughs> challenges. <laughs> well, well, you have the luxury now because you've put in the, the base work to be able to play in that area, run experiments and see what works and what doesn't work. I mean, the most important aspect is getting eyes on the prize, doing that year and a half to two years of YouTube videos and putting out that marketing to build that baseline brand of people that know you, find you, all those things. Then you can build a company around it. Then you can optimize the website. Then you can optimize the products. Then you can try new price tags on different things and see what hits and what doesn't hit. But when you're building all these products and then trying to market, you may find yourself, wow, I shouldn't have spent so much time on product making and more time on just getting eyeballs on my, my ish. Otherwise, I mean, that, that kills so many companies, right? You know, instead of creating an MVP, they create an entire product suite that hasn't been truly tested. It's like getting that initial how cheat like this is one of my good friends dan hunt he's one of the most successful young entrepreneurs i i know he's just incredible he's built two very successful companies had uh, one massive exit and he was just talking about what's the cheapest most easy way that i can get a product into the market just to see if it gets any sort of traction or finds any sort of worth I'm going to do that. And then once I do that, I'm going to then be able to make the decision whether or not that product actually hits. So I just really like your approach of building that marketing engine, starting with Patreon and then moving into these other aspects. Yeah, that's actually, um, I like that, that vision, that idea where it's like, what's the easiest way to get in? Um, Andrew and I have a friend who's been doing YouTube for a while and um, he is inside of his niche, which is uh, FPV drones probably the highest tier um, FPV drone pilot out there. And he has tons of products. Um, and his kind of flagship product is, uh, is, is electric motors for his, uh, his quads, for his drones. And um, they have a certain amount of hours of flight time, which means that they're consumables. So one of the things that we're in the process of trying to develop um, is a consumable. And um, something that is on the price point between, you know, anywhere between 40 to 60 bucks that gets replaced every three months, maybe, or gets worn out in every three months. And um, that's, that's challenging because um, when it comes to DME, the D stands for durable, durable medical equipment. It's meant to not be chewed up and last for long. Um, but there is one particular item, um, which is a urological supply. So uh, as a spinal cord injury, 
um, I am unable to empty my bladder the same way you're able to empty your bladder. Um, every time I empty my bladder, I take a small plastic tube and insert it into my body and that allows the urine to, to leave. That is a consumable product. And we've been thinking like, okay, we looked into manufacturing. That is insane. Like red tape all over the place, FDA up your butt, audit here, insurance this, like it's crazy. So we said, okay, let's back out of that. The next thing we thought was about distribution. Well, distribution would be good because that means that we can use a bunch of different manufacturers, conglomerate together and work on distribution. But again, a lot of insurance, red tape, a lot of challenges and difficulties um, with uh, finding experts that are willing to work with you. And um, you need a full team. You need someone to run the thing. You need someone to do the warehousing. You need the one to do the sales. Like it's this whole, this whole thing. So we're sitting here scratching our head going like, we want to try to make money in catheters because we know catheters are where like the real money is. And for people like us, like we, all people with spinal cord injuries, not all, but like a huge percent of them use catheters and use them multiple times a day. And there's a bunch of diversity inside of those catheters as well. So we've been like just scratching our head and scratching our head and scratching our head. And um, luckily we're in this process where we're cultivating a relationship um, with um, a current existing uh, distributor who is hoping to retire in a couple of years. And we're, we're really heavily considering maybe even like an equity deal with them. Or, or something along the lines to where we can really, really, really push that product hard and make money with that product, but not necessarily be um, specifically like contractually, you know, structurally on paper involved with them. Um, but that's always kind of complicated because um, equity deals, as we know, are very risky, um, especially if you're doing equity only and not cash plus equity. So it's complicated, man. We're just doing a lot of, a lot of times on the phone, a lot of meetings, a lot of conversations. Um, I've even been in conversations with um, the wheelchair brand that I use because they've been super cool to us that, you know, we want to continue working with them. They even have a product that we like so much that honestly, we might want to just grab and, you know, start selling it as our own. You know, there's, there's a lot of opportunities out there, but um, we want to make sure that we say, right, say yes to the right opportunity for the right money. We don't want to say yes to the wrong opportunity for the right money or the right opportunity for the wrong money. We want to make sure we have the right opportunity for the right money and we're holding out. Um, and luckily we're at a place where currently, like you mentioned, we're doing everything autonomously. Like we believe very strongly in independence autonomously. We don't want to be contractually obligated with anyone for any reason to kind of box us into a little hole. Like we want complete freedom. So we're in this place where we quite literally actually have the ability to work with anyone as long as it's the right product or service for the right money. And um, that's kind of the, this, this ongoing cycle that we're working on because we've got plenty of proofs of concepts like we know this marketing engine works we're just ready to be let loose so to speak that's great man you guys have combined preparation plus wisdom plus experience you got the ship ready you're ready to light the match and boom off and you're in that position and you understand it and you're and you're just waiting because you put so much time and effort into just building something that when you put your stamp of approval on it it better be what you want it to be otherwise you just lose your credibility and credibility is better be a banger. That's for, that's for sure. It better be a banger, like a real banger. <laughs> so if you could go back and, and this is sort of something that I, I love to just hear from just any human that has accomplished amazing things, business aside, your business acumen is amazing. Congrats to you and Andrew. I, it's so funny. Cause I remember seeing you guys on the boardwalk before I knew you, but I almost didn't think it was you guys. Cause I didn't really know you like at all at that point. I think Andrew reached out to me a long time before and I didn't say hi and I regretted it so bad. Um, but then we ran into, into each other at vid summit. So it worked well. Yeah. Which was dope. Um, but if you could go back in time, uh, maybe, maybe right after you got that, that wheelchair accident and you could have told yourself one, two or three things that could have just saved you a ton of time, money, heartache, headache, uh, any of those things. And, and a great answer to this is I wouldn't have changed anything because it made me who I am today. Um, but if there were some sort of applicable things that older you and younger you could, could collide, what would that look like? The number one thing I'd say is don't separate yourself from the community. 
Um, you're not as unique as you think you are, and you're not as different as you think you are. Um, that was one of the largest mistakes that I made was that um, after I was a wheelchair user and I was disabled, you know, I attempted to get involved into a little bit of sports. Um, I attempted to get involved um, in a little bit of adaptive, adaptive stuff. And, you know, I had a few friends here and there, but I had unfortunately a real negative mindset um, towards community, um, specifically the disabled community, because I would just, I would just say, oh, I'm not like them. Oh, I'm different. I'm not as, as messed up as they are. Oh, I'm not a loser. You know, I had all these really negative, like ableist uh, mindsets towards things, but um, that's, that's my biggest word of caution is I think that I would have not taken the dip that I took and I would have not taken the dip so uh, tragically. But like you said before, the best answer is usually always nothing because I wouldn't be the person I am today. But um, that's always the thing that I encourage um, all my wheelie boys, all my new guys that I that reach out to me is like get involved in a community and stick with it, whether it's through sports, whether it's in my comment section, whether it's on Instagram, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's listening to the podcast whatever it is, get involved in community because um, inside of the world of spinal cord injury, if you are around people who have a spinal cord injury like you do, your life expectancy doubles. It goes up by 50%. Um, and that's been studied. That's like a fact, like that's a real thing. And what that means is uh, uh, people with spinal cord injuries, we have a lot of secondary complications, a lot of comorbidity. And um, there's a lot of uh, prevention stuff that we have to do and a lot of questions that we have and a lot of advice we give each other. And if you've separated yourself from that community, you're missing out on potentially life-saving advice. And um, that's the, the biggest piece of advice I would have is don't think you're better. Don't think you're different. Don't think you're unique. You're just like everybody else. Learn from the experts and try not to make the mistakes that they made. Boom. And it takes, it takes confidence and it takes just overall belief and heart and, and courage to even reach out to those people and look for them. Um, so dude, you're an inspiration. Keep making moves, keep doing what you're doing. Keep the channel going. You and Andrew are, are making huge moves, man. This is just the beginning to an absolute dynasty wheels to walking. What an epic brand. What an epic brand. You see the wheels to walking sign in the background. You got to get that on the license plate. Got to get the bumper sticker. This brand is taken off. Uh, how can people follow you? How can people continue to, to follow the brand, your podcast, all that? You can find everything on wheels to walking.com. Um, I've got all of my socials linked there. I've got my store linked there. I've got podcast stuff linked there. And if you are a product or a service that wants to work with us, we even have a work with us tab that you can click on to. And basically um, it's a little populated list where it just kind of, it has questions. You answer the questions and we'll get back to you. Boom. I appreciate you, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm really uh, happy to be here with you today and we'll talk later. Till next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of Len Jones Party of Two. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review and subscribe to stay up to date on our new episodes. And remember, hope is not a strategy. Keep making moves. Till next time, peace.